how to plant a seed for a miracle. Well, we're finding out some things from the Word of God. We're finding out that the kingdom of God is within you, and you sow the seed of God's Word into your heart, into your spirit, and it brings forth fruit. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if a man cast seed into the ground. I'm the one planting the seeds in my heart. Now, see, go to the 12th chapter of Matthew, and Jesus backs that up again. He said, out of the bones of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And he said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. Now, listen to him. The good man does it out of the good deposit of his heart. What he's deposited in his heart, if it's good things he's deposited there, it will be good things that he'll bring out. How does he bring them out? He speaks them out. He takes his mouth. He fills his mouth with the good treasure. What is the good treasure? God's Word. God's Word is the good treasure. Our faith-filled words in line with God's Word is the good treasure that will absolutely produce a harvest for you, a blessing, financial blessing, physical blessing, healing for your body, when you learn to plant and to reap the harvest of good things. Now, let me show you what's happened in this area. And some of you are held in bondage by this. You have said all the bad things, and you've talked all your problems, all your troubles. You've become so engrossed with problems, with troubles, until you can't see the answer. You've sowed bad words of doubt and fear and unbelief. Now, I know that it's harder to do than it is to say these things. I know some of you sitting there thinking, well, now, it's easy for him to say that. Because, you see, he's not in my situation. Well, no, I'm not in your situation. But I've been in situations similar, I'm sure, to your situation. And I applied the Word of God by the words of my mouth to that situation and spoke what should be instead of what was until it absolutely transformed my thinking, my mind, my spirit, and it brought a miracle to pass in my life. God's Word is no respecter of persons. God's Word will work for you. God's Word will produce miracles, and I'm here to tell you the good news. It'll work a miracle in your life if you'll apply it. All right, we've found out that as we sow seeds, we speak words. That becomes seeds and are planted in our heart, and it produces for us. Now, you see, we use the analogy of the earth if we planted a seed in the earth, and the earth said, no, I'm not going to raise cotton or soybeans, I'm going to raise cucumbers or strawberries or something else. Well, we know that the earth is not designed that way. The earth is designed to produce what we put in it. Well, now, that's what Jesus says right here. He said in verse 27, that he should sleep and rise night and day, the seed should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. Now, he's telling you how the kingdom of God within you works. This is how the kingdom of God works. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. So it is inside you where this takes place. You're speaking words that sow seeds into your heart or to your spirit. We call it heart or spirit. And it will produce. It'll bring forth a harvest. Now, we talked about if the ground were to say to me when I planted the seed in the soil, we're not going to raise that. We're going to raise whatever we want to raise. Well, we know that's ridiculous. The ground of the earth does not decide what is to be raised. The man that plants the seed is the one that decides what it is that is to be produced. Now, when you understand that, you realize that God is sharing a secret with you of how the kingdom of God operates inside you. So if you begin to sow the right seeds, speak the right things, apply the right principles, no, no, I didn't say just say some things. See, there's more to it than saying it. There's more to it than just saying some things. There's applying the principles of the kingdom. There's walking in the Bible, the whole Bible. Now, quite often people say this. They say, well, you know, that couldn't be true because that's just too simple. But then again, don't you know that Jesus never did th make anything hard? It's always us, you know, the, the earthlings, who we'd call them, that try to make things hard. Jesus never did make things hard. He's telling you how the kingdom of God operates. All right, if the earth does not decide what is to be produced, 
then who decides? What determines what is to be produced in the soil when a farmer, let's say a farmer goes out here and he plants him a garden or, or he plants him some wheat. What is the determining factor in what will grow in that ground where he planted? It's the seed that determines it, isn't it? That is the determining factor. It is not the soil that decides. It is the seed that determines. Now the man determines what seed is planted. Let's read it again out of the Bible, because Jesus said this. I didn't say it. I'm just telling you what he said. Verse 26, he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man cast seed. So he's telling you that the man that deter the one that is determining what's going to come about in their life is the individual. Now, you see, quite often people just t turn it all over to God, and they say, well, I'll just turn my life over to God, and just whatever God decides is best for me. Well, no, you can't do that because God has turned it over to you. Now, you, you can't shift the responsibility back to God and expect God to take the blame for everything that happens to you because the Word of God says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose there. In other words, the Amplified says it this way. I think it's a little easier to understand, said you have authority to bind whatever is already bound in heaven. You have authority to loose what is already loosed in heaven. Well, I want you to know that what God says in his word is what's already loosed up there. Thank God this healthy place up there. Thank God there's abundance up there. Thank God there's no curse up there. Then we can bind these things here on the earth. Now, how do we do it? We do it by planting seeds, by saying things, by coming into agreement with God's Word, by applying the principles of God's Word. God's Word is a divine design to operate in the human spirit right here. And this is what Jesus called the soil. The inner man is the soil that you plant the seed in. Now, we talked about already that the seed determines that. The man determines what seed is planted. But now let's say, for instance, that I would go out to my farm crew, the men that worked for me, and say to them, well, you remember this certain field over here last year? Now, we had problem with this field growing Johnson grass. We had quite a Johnson grass problem in that, and I'm not just making up a story. We did have some trouble with some Johnson grass in a certain field. But now, you see, if I would say to the boys, now, we had a problem with Johnson grass in this field, so what we're going to do is we're going to get us a bunch of Johnson grass seed you know, go out somewhere and buy me some Johnson grass seed. And when we start planting our crop, put those Johnson grass seed in the planter hopper and go out there and plant it in this certain field where we had trouble with Johnson grass. You know what had happened? I can tell you what had happened. The men that's standing around there watching me, they're going to tie me up and send me off to an institution to see what's wrong with me. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, they got better sense than that. They know that if you're having trouble with Johnson grass, you don't want to sow any more Johnson grass seed. Now, see, you can understand that. Nobody would be that foolish in the natural. I mean, not a person, there's not a farmer. I don't know a farmer living that'd be that dumb. It's to take the problem that he's having and start sowing the problem back in the very field where he has the problem. But yet, in the spiritual realm, people are doing that. They're taking their problems. They say, well, I have this problem. And so they began to dwell and talk about their problem. They began to pray the problem. They began to talk their problems. Now, I know I've talked about this before, and I've said it a lot, and some of you may feel like, well, I just wish he'd get off of that, but we're going to stay on it till the Spirit of God says it's enough because some of you are still getting it. Some of you haven't heard it before. You're seeing some things that you've not seen before. You wouldn't dare do that. No more than a farmer wouldn't dare go out and plant weed seed where he's had trouble with weeds. It would be the most foolish thing that he could do. But yet Christian people have done that. Christian people have taken their problems and become so engrossed with their problems until when they began to sow seeds, when they began to plant, they start planning their problems. Now, you see, we said the sower soweth the word. See, you've been sowing seeds all time. 
And some of you, whether you want to realize it or not, whether you want to agree with me or not, but you are experiencing things today that you have sowed in the days past. There is a law of sowing and reaping. And when you learn about that law, then the, you begin to apply the principles of God's Word to straighten out some areas in your life. Some of you are learning some things that will absolutely transform your lives. Now, there are going to be some of you that will say, Oh, no, I don't believe that. And you're not going to accept it. You're going to turn away from it. And you're going to go right on reaping the harvest of weed seed that you've sown. You're still sowing those old weed seed. And you're wondering why God allowed these things to come to pass. Well, I want you to know, folks, it's not up to God. It's up to you to decide what you're going to plant in your field. And God says the field is your spirit. God says the earth is your spirit, the human spirit. The kingdom of God is if a man casts seed into the ground. What kind of seed are you planting in your ground? What kind of things are you saying? What is it that you are sowing in the garden of your heart? Well, it won't be long till you'll find out, because what you put in there will come up. Eventually, they'll come up. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good deposit of his heart bringeth forth good things. But on the other hand, see, there's a two-sided deal there. On the other hand, an evil man or a man that stores evil in his heart out of the evil treasure of his heart, he will bring forth also. But what's he bringing forth? Well, I'll tell you what he's bringing forth. He's bringing forth what's in his heart. That's all he can bring forth. Whatever you plant in the soil is what you're going to bring forth at the day of harvest. You're not going to be able to plant one thing and bring forth another. Now, there's some things here that God's wanting you to get a hold of. God's trying to reveal to you some things that will absolutely, I mean absolutely, transform your life. Now, I want us to look at verse 28 in chapter 4 of Mark. It says, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. See, we're talking about confession of faith, speaking things that you believe, speaking things you desire to come to pass. Now, you see, we followed Jairus as Jesus went with him to his house, and we found out that Jesus didn't speak the problem. He didn't talk his trouble. He talked the answer. We followed Jesus as he went to Jairus' house and found out that the woman with the issue of blood applied the God kind of faith, the principle, the kingdom principles. And she just absolutely ignored the problem, so to speak, and began to latch on to the answer, began to take hold of the answer, and began to speak the answer. You know what she's doing? She's planting the good seed. Jesus ignored the fact that the little daughter was dead and said, She sleepeth. What's he doing? He's planting the seed that produced a miracle. Some of you need to plant a seed in your life that will produce a miracle. How do you sow the seed in your life? How do you sow the seed in your heart? Do it the way the Bible said do it. Begin to speak and begin to say. Begin to say to the sycamine tree. Begin to say to that cancer. Begin to say to that emphysema. Begin to say to that asthma condition. Begin to say to it, Be thou removed, be cast into the sea. Begin to talk the answer, in other words. Don't talk the problem. Don't deal with a problem. Don't become so closely associated with your problems until problems is all you see. Now, you see, I want to carry you back to that hypothetical situation that we talked about, about taking weed seed and putting in the planter and going out and planting it in the soil. You see, nobody's that foolish. But yet people are planting their problems by the words of their mouth, going out of their own voice into their human spirit. And the human spirit is a design of God to produce the very things that you are saying. You see, Jesus said it right here in this passage of Scripture. He said it will bring forth fruit of itself. Your human spirit will bring forth the fruit that is planted in there. All right, let's say it this way. Let's review it just briefly. Jesus said the kingdom of God is as if a man cast seed into the ground. Now, the man is the one that determines. Now, that man is you, or that individual is you. No, it's not someone else. It's you. You're the one that determines what seed goes there. Don't allow the devil to determine what you plant in your heart. 
Don't allow the enemy, don't allow some old unbelieving church member to talk you out of planting the good seeds of faith in your heart. Then he said, the kingdom of God is if a man cast seed into the ground, and he would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would spring up, and he doesn't know how. He doesn't know how it does it. He doesn't understand it. Some of you are saying, well, I don't understand how it'll do it. Let me say something. You don't have to understand all there is about it. All you need to do is learn to apply the principle. You see, God will give you an understanding of it eventually if you'll apply the principle. You may not understand some of the things that I've said here today, but I challenge you to go to the Word of God. I challenge you to take God at His Word and just begin to apply the principles of His Word. And I'll tell you, God's principles will work for you. They'll work for you like they work for the woman with the issue of blood. They'll work for you like they work for other individuals in the Bible. No, this is not something that just happens once in a while. It's just something that happened here once in the Bible. It happened all through the Bible. It happened over in the Old Testament. In fact, I want us to go into the Old Testament. I want you to see some of that. In the Old Testament, where there was a woman that went into a situation that was absolutely so far beyond what you could comprehend with your mind until we read it and just shake our head and say, well, I don't understand that. I can't understand how in the world that a woman could do that. I want you to look with me in 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, see, we're talking about sowing good seeds, speaking things, not speaking your problems, but speaking the answer to problems. Now, someone would say, well, now, that's just lying if you're saying things that are not already true. Well, let's go to the Word of God and see if that's true. See, I believe that the church needs to be educated to what's a lie and what is the principles of the kingdom. See, there's kingdom principles involved in this thing. Now, in the fourth chapter of 2 Kings, we find here that Elisha the prophet was going through this certain place, and a woman, it says a great woman, in other words, a woman of wealth, said, let's build this prophet a chamber, where when he comes by, and we'll put a table in there and a candle and all that, when he comes by, then he'll have a place to rest. So they built a prophet's chamber. And uh, Elisha prophesied to this woman. Now, see, she was barren. She didn't have a child. She was barren, and Elisha prophesied to her and said, you'll bear a child at a certain season of the year. said, you'll bear a child. And she said, now, don't lie to me. In other words, don't be telling me anything's not true. And he said, well, it'll come to pass. Well, it did. It came to pass exactly like the prophet of God said. Now, I want us to begin reading in verse 18 of the fourth chapter. And it says, And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went with his father to the reapers. And he said to his father, My head, my head. And his father said to the lad, Carry him to his mother. Now, don't you listen to this. Here's the child. The promise has already been fulfilled. She had the child. He's up of a, a good age now. And uh, he goes out into the field where they're harvesting. And the child said, my head uh, evidently had a heat stroke or some kind of stroke. And so the father sent him to his mother. Now listen to what happened. When he got to his mother, it says he sat on her knee till noon and then he died. Yeah, it says he died. And, and there's a little footnote here. It says apparently from a sunstroke. Well, we don't know for sure, but that's what they say about it. All right, the little child is dead. The promised child is dead. Now the woman had the child sitting on her knee, and he died. Now listen to what she did. She took this child, went up, and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and shut the door upon him, and went out. Now I want you to listen to the wisdom of God that this woman used. She went into the prophet's chamber, and she laid this child on the bed where the prophet of God had been sleeping. You know the anointing of God will saturate a cloth. You see, Jesus' garment was saturated with the healing power. In other words, the anointing of God was there. This woman, I don't know how she knew to do that, but she did. She went and took that child and laid him on the prophet's bed. Evidently, there's still some anointing there, but the child's dead. He is dead. Now, listen to what the woman did. She went and called for her husband and said, Have the servant to saddle me a donkey. He said, I'm going to ride to the prophet of God. Well, she told the servant, said, you ride to the prophet of God and said, don't you slack, don't you talk to anybody, but just go right straight to the prophet of God. 
Well, that's where they went. They went to the prophet of God. Now, listen to what happened when she comes to the prophet of God. Well, let me tell you what she said first to her husband. Now, I want you to realize something. Here's a woman that her son is dead. She did not even tell her husband. Not in the least did she, you know, go and say, I don't know why God allowed this to happen to us. God promised me a child. Now, why in the world would he take my child? See, some of you, you're struggling with this. You're wondering why in the world God allowed some death in your family. Let me tell you something, folks. That's not God's responsibility. I want you to realize God is not the one that's the perpetrator of death. But here this woman said, I'll ride to the prophet of God. And the husband said to her, Why are you going? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath day. Why are you going to the prophet of God? I want you to listen to what she said. She said, It shall be well. It shall be well. Now, this is a serious situation. Just put yourself in that situation. Your boy's dead. He's dead. And you didn't even tell your husband. And the husband said, Why are you going to the prophet? Why are you going down to that healing meeting? Why are you going down to the prophet of God? Everything going to be all right? Well, most people think you're nuts. I tell you, you've, you've got to screw loose somewhere. No, thank God, applying kingdom principles. That's what this woman did. She applied kingdom principles. You know, if the husband had known about it, I don't know what he'd have said. But she said, all shall be well. Now, they ride to the prophet of God, and here they go. They're down there to the prophet of God, and listen to what happens. And Gehazi said, Yonder comes the Shunammite woman. And Elisha says, Well, said, Run, I pray thee, and meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with thy child? Now, I want you to listen. Now, I know that there's some good church members, some good believing Christian people that are right in their heart, but they're wrong in their head. Bless their hearts. They think that you're lying if you say things that are not already in existence. They don't understand kingdom principles. But I want you to know that this woman is operating in kingdom principles. She's op operating in a principle of the kingdom that will absolutely get her child raised from the dead. How did she know that? I don't know. I can't explain to you how she knew that. She didn't have Mark eleven twenty three. She didn't have the great faith scriptures that we have today in the New Testament. She was not operating under the New Covenant. She's still under the Old Covenant. But thank God she got a hold of something that caused her to hang on to faith and with, as we would say, the tenacity of a bulldog when there was no hope, all hope was gone. She just absolutely spoke what she desired to come to pass. Now notice... She said, all shall be well. Then Elijah sent Gehazi out there, said, ask her, is it well with your child? Now listen to what the woman said. It is well. Oh, glory to God, I'll tell you. If that won't turn you on, Mac, your well's gone dry. If that won't prime your pump, your well's gone dry. And some of you, I'm not so sure, but what maybe you well hadn't gone dry <laughs> because I tell you, there's something here you need to get a hold of. You can begin to see some things in this that'll absolutely transform your life. No, she didn't go down there and tell the prophet of God all her troubles. I don't know why you told me that I was going to have a son. And then God come and took my son. Thank God she didn't accuse God of killing her child. No, it wasn't God that did it. It's Satan that stole her child. It wasn't God at all. And you need to realize that Satan's been stealing from you all these years and accusing God of doing it. And some of you just butted up with him and went out and tell him that God did it. God did one-tenth of the things that people accused him of doing. If he lived on earth, he'd be in a penitentiary all of his life. He never would get out of the pen. Because we've got civil laws that put people in jail that kill little children and cause sickness and disease and problems. We have civil laws that would put people in jail to do that. Well, you ought to realize God's not doing that, folks. This woman said, all is well. Well, I want to ask you something. Was all well? Was everything all right with her? You know it wasn't. You know her child was dead. The Bible says her child was dead. 
But what is she doing? She's speaking the thing she desires. Now see, let's carry this over into the Old Testament. A man will have whatsoever he saith, if he believe and doubt not in his heart. I don't know how she knew that principle, but she knew it. I don't know how she got to operating in that, but she operated in it, and thank God she got her son raised from the dead. And Elisha sent Gehazi out there and said, take my mantle to take it up there and lay it on the child. Well, he went up there and did it. It didn't work. Nothing happened. The prophet of God went up there and laid himself upon the child, walked back and forth through the house, laid himself upon the child again. And then the child waxed warm, and the Bible said that he sneezed seven times and rose up. Well, thank God, here's a woman that operated in kingdom principles, and she got a miracle in her life. She got a miracle that come to her house. It got her son raised from the dead. Some of you need a miracle, and you can have a miracle in your life if you'll apply the principles of God's Word. I think this is where we miss it sometimes. People don't realize that there is a practical application to God's Word. They think, well, now, that was good for the Shunammite woman. That's great that it worked for her. And then they say, well, you know, that's great that it worked for David. See, the same principle worked for David. He said some things with his mouth. Now, see, we have talked about words that we speak being seeds that's sown in your heart. We've talked about having your words come forth out of your heart and produce the very thing you're saying, leading you in a direction where it'll cause the things you're saying to come to pass. And I know some of you have been wondering, well, now, how do I apply that, though, in my circumstance and in my situation? Because some of you need a miracle in your life. Some of you need to know how to apply this in a practical application in your situation. Well, now, the only way I know to do that is give you some illustrations, some things that have happened in my life. But before I get into that, I want to caution you this. Quite often people say, you know, Brother Caps did this, and I'm going to do that exactly the way he did it, and then it'll have to work for me. But I want to remind you that God spoke to me in some of these areas, directed me to do some of these things, and I want you to realize if God directs you to do that, then it's all right for you to do it. But don't just do it because I did it. Now, the application of the same principle is quite all right for you to apply. But you see, I bought a farm several years ago. The Lord directed me to do it. I prayed about the thing. I got the mind of the Lord on it. And the Spirit of God said, go ahead and buy the farm. Well, you see, I wouldn't start out telling you to, you know, just go out and buy a farm when the Lord didn't tell you to do that. And that's not what we intend to do, is lead you out in the area and get you into presumption, get you in trouble. But we're going to share with you how to apply the principles of God's Word, of how faith works. He said, therefore, see, because a man will have whatsoever he saith, if he believe and doubt not in his heart, therefore, what things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. Well, now I want you to know that he's talking about believing when you pray. No, don't believe when it looks like it's going to come to pass. You believe when you pray. And this is part of the practical application of the Word of God that we're teaching. Now, several years ago, it's been about six or seven years now, I was praying one day, and I, I was in farming business then, and I said to the Lord, Now, Lord, I need some more land, and I don't know where the land is. I don't have any idea. I was interested in renting more land. And I said, Lord, I want you to lead me or cause the land to come to me in Jesus' name. I see in your word where you said in Mark 11, 23 and 24 that I could have what I say if I believe and if I doubt not in my heart. So therefore, you said, when I pray, believe I receive those things. So I prayed, and I said, now, Lord, I'm praying that I receive the land that I need. I was talking about leasing the land. The furthest thing from my mind, actually, was buying any land at that point because, frankly, I was not in a position to buy the land. I was operating on borrowed money. I didn't have any money. I was in bad financial condition, to tell you the truth. I just began to learn to operate in the principles of God's Word. 
So what happened in that situation was that that morning that I prayed, I just simply turned it over to the Lord. And I said, Now, Lord, I've established in your word what you said, and I've prayed, and I believe that I receive now, this morning, I believe I receive the land, and I began to praise God for it and just walked off. You know, I'm through praying. Somebody said, well, did you go back and just keep praying about it? No, no, I didn't pray about it anymore. I'm finished. I'm through. Now, in prayer sometimes, I would begin to praise God and thank God. I'd say, Father, I thank you that I have received the land that I requested on a certain morning, you know, when I prayed. I didn't go back and dig that seed up and begin to pray over it again. I began to praise God for that. Now, I simply praised God for it and just forgot about it. Mostly for that part, I just forgot about it because I considered it done. Well, now, about two weeks later, one morning I was around the house there and I, the telephone rang. And my wife answered the phone and then she called me to the phone and there was my landlady that I was renting some land from her. She said, we've decided we're going to sell our farm. Do you want to buy it? <laughs> well, you know, here I am. I knew what kind of financial situation I'm in, and I stuttered for a little bit. I mean, it caught me off guard, and my first thought was, well, I couldn't buy that land because, you see, I don't have any money. And then I heard the Spirit of God rise up in me and say, what have you been confessing? See, I had been confessing for weeks and months, in fact, for a year or more, that I have abundance, there is no lack, for my God meets my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, and there is no lack because I have given, it is given unto me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, I'm quoting out of God's word in confessing abundance when there's lack on every side. Now, you see, people think, well, now, you must have been lying. No, I wasn't lying, just saying what God said about me. I told the Lord one morning when I was confessing that, I said, Lord, it seems to me like I'm just lying about this thing. And he said right in my spirit, he said, Son, how could you lie saying what I said? Oh, praise God, I tell you, that's like saying sick them to a bulldog. Now, I'm sitting there holding the phone, and the lady said, We're going to sell our farm. You want to buy it? Well, now, there's a little background to that you need to know. This farm was the farm that the people that founded the town of England, Arkansas, this was their farm. They'd had it in the family a hundred years. And they wouldn't sell the farm, they wouldn't sell any part of the farm to anyone. People tried to buy it. But now, here, after I prayed, believe God, release my faith, and just acted on the Word of God, in two weeks, the phone call comes. We're going to sell the farm. You want to buy it? Now, that rose up in my spirit, and I heard in my spirit this, what have you been confessing? Well, I've been confessing I have abundance, no lack. My God meets my need according to his riches in glory. Well, if the farm's for sale, I have a need, and my God will meet that need. So here's what I heard myself say over that phone. Yeah, I'd like to buy the farm. In fact, I'll come up and talk to you tonight and make you an offer on the farm. I hung up the phone, and my wife said to me, said, what are you going to use for money? And the thing that came out of my spirit because of the confessions that I'd made day after day, week after week, for nearly a year, or maybe over a year, the word came right up out of my spirit. Money is no problem. Now, she knew better than that. She knew that I didn't have any money to put down on the farm. Now, I want to make a long story short. We're going to speed this up because... We want to get to some areas here that we want to share some other things about. So I went up to the people that night and made them an offer, you know, when I considered a fair offer on the farm. And over a three-week period, there were negotiations. Now, during that three-week time, there were other people that began to bid on the farm. It got spread around and other people knew about it. And there was a man that had suggested that he would probably pay some $75,000 more than I had bid on the farm. And I had gone up to talk with the people that day, and they said, well, it looks like it's not going to work out where you can buy it because of this other man. When I, on the way home, I said to the Lord, I said, now, Lord, I don't receive that in the name of Jesus. I proclaim that the farm is ours. We've agreed. We've come into agreement. I thank you, Father, the farm's ours in Jesus' name. And I began to pray in the Spirit and worship the Lord in the Spirit. Over. And I heard within my spirit, I heard this come up in my spirit, go talk to the man. You know who the man is that's bidding against you. Go talk to him. 
Now, see, I didn't realize it, but this is what the Spirit of God was saying. Go speak to the mountain. Now, see, we've been talking about Jesus said, speak to the mountain, speak to the sycamine tree. So I was obedient to what the Spirit of God said. I went out and talked to the man. Well, as it turned out, the man said this. He said, well, I really don't need the farm. He said, I just thought it was a good investment. He said, if you really want it, he said, I'll withdraw my bid. And thank God he did. The next morning, he withdrew his bid. They sold the farm to me at my price. Everything worked out. Now, you see, if this would have happened a year or so before, when they said, no, it's not going to work out, another man has outbid you, I'd have said, well, I knew it's too good to be true. I just don't know what about, I don't know why these things, nothing ever good happens to me. See, there was opportunity to receive defeat. Some of you had opportunity to receive defeat, and you just simply received defeat. But I want you to know that if you will hold fast to the confession of your faith, as the Word of God says, God's Word will work for you, and it will cause things to happen in your life, things that are absolutely far out beyond what you've imagined could come to pass. Now, the end of that story didn't end there. You see, when I went to sign the papers for the farm, the man said, you know, we never intended to sell this farm at all. Didn't intend to sell it. But he said, we didn't know it was worth that much money. He said, we'd be foolish not to sell the farm. We can put the money in the bank and draw more interest than we're getting rent off the farm or lease money off the farm. So they had decided to put the farm up for sale, find out what it's worth, then he was going to buy it and keep it in the family. One of the heirs was going to buy it and keep it in the family. So the day that I stood in my living room and said, i buy the farm, Money is no problem. Well, the farm was not even for sale at that time to the public. But because we established that, joined hands and agreed, we saw God work a miracle in that situation. That has been one of the most tremendous miracles that God performed in our lives. It was one of the first. Let's put it that way. There's been others, and there will be many others. We realize then that faith operates on a principle. When you apply the principles of faith in a practical application, then the practical things will happen. You begin to see the power of God move in your behalf. I remember us driving by, and if I recall, I rolled my window down several times on my automobile and stick my head out and say, you belong to me, you're mine, <laughs> you know. Well, now, you see, people think, well, now, that's ridiculous. Well, I, I may be a little ridiculous, but I own the farm. <laughs> you know, I mean, don't knock it until you've tried it or put it in motion and get it to work. Now, you see, it's the simple things that we miss sometimes. Now, let's see, does this agree with the Word of God? Does it agree with what Jesus said? Whosoever shall say to the mountain, whosoever shall speak. Now, you see, I spoke to the man that was bidding against me on the farm, and he was removed. I mean, he just decided, well, I'll just withdraw my bid and let you have the farm. And thank God that's exactly what happened. Now, I want to share this, and we'll, we'll get into a little different area. Before they got the abstract all brought up to date, of course, I had sold 40 acres of that farm to the school district to build a school on. And uh, I ended up, when we closed the deal, I ended up with $57,000 equity in the farm and had not put one single penny in it because I sold the school district uh, part of it to build a school on for quite a bit more than I paid for it. It gave me a $57,000 equity in the farm, and I hadn't put one red cent in it. Now, you know, that's got to be God. That's got to be the wisdom of God. Now, I'm not that smart. I'm sharing with you how to practically apply the principles, the kingdom principles of God's Word. When you realize this, you can go to the Word of God and search out these things and find out that you can talk to things. Now, Jesus talked to the fig tree, and he said, you could talk to sycamine tree, you could talk to mountains. Now, on another occasion, after this, two or three years after that, this situation of the farm got my finances in a lot better shape. I tell you, it did wonders for my financial statement because I'll tell you, my financial statement wasn't the best in the world, but it began to increase because right at that time was when farms began to go up. And by the time the deal was closed, the farm was worth a lot more money, and it did wonders for my financial statement. Now, 
I started a housing project just north of town there on part of this land. It was good development land. I started a housing project there. I borrowed a lot of money, started this housing project, and uh, I had plenty of time. But then I got involved in the ministry, the teaching ministry. I got involved in sharing the Word of God of how this will work for other people. And God began to lead me out to share it with other people. And I had those notes on that housing project, and the teaching ministry was just coming alive, and doors were opening to go teach the Word of God. And I said, well, you know, I need to get rid of this thing. I don't need it, and I certainly don't need these notes. So one day, I called my daughter, Annette, in, and I said, Annette, I want you to come in here in the den where we <laughs> were. And I had got all of my notes out. There was about three different notes, three different times I'd borrowed money on that piece of property to put in the soil and the water and all of that. And I said, I want you to be a witness to this. I want you to witness what I'm about to do, that it's in agreement with God's Word, and I want you to stand in agreement with this witness, that I am going to do what Jesus said, and I am going to talk to my notes. <laughs> now, I know some of you sitting there thinking, well, now, he must be a nut. Well, you can just call me whatever you want to, but I just made up my mind. I'm going to do what Jesus said to do in the Bible. He said, speak to the mountain. He said, speak to the sycamine tree. The notes was the mountain. I mean, I had a mountain of notes, money that I owed, mortgages. So I called her in there, and I said this. I said, papers, notes, listen to me. I am talking to you. Now, I don't know whether they hear you or not. Jesus said, talk to them. He didn't say they heard you. He just said they would obey you. So I would assume that your words can penetrate even inanimate objects and cause something supernatural to take place. Now, don't ask me to explain it all. I don't understand it all. But I do know what Jesus said. He said to do it. And I just sat in there one day, you know, meditating the Word of God and decided, well, bless God, if Jesus said do it, why don't I do it? And I started doing that. Now, you see, that happened in about three months then. I'd say maybe three to six months. The notes were paid. Now, I walked out to that housing project, and I was having trouble selling two of those houses. And I said to the Lord one day, I said, Now, Lord, I prayed and agreed, you know, and I've confessed the Word of God over that. Now, I'd like to know why it hadn't come to pass. You know, when you begin to operate in the Word of God, you have to ask the Lord sometimes where you missed it. And here's what the Spirit of God said to me. He said, why don't you do what you've been teaching? <laughs> well, you know, you know, he said, why don't you take your own medicine? Well, I said, you mean talk to him? And he said, that's what I mean. So I walked out there to the house. Now, the house is built. It's sitting up there. I mean, everything looks fine. And I get out of my car and walk over to that house. And I said, house... In the name of Jesus, I'm talking to you. Now, some of you are thinking, I'll tell you, that must be the strangest guy that ever lived. No, I'm just applying the principles of God's Word. That's why they thought Jesus was so strange, because he talked to the wind, he talked to the sea, he talked to the waves, he talked to dead people. They all obeyed him. I said to the house, be sold. I walked into the house. I talked to the house. Now, you know, Jesus said that. I'm just doing what Jesus said. Somebody said, didn't you feel kind of silly doing that? Yes, I did. <laughs> I'd be the first day. I'd be dishonest if I didn't say that I felt silly doing that. Went down to the other house, did the same thing. Well, thank God, within a couple of weeks, the house is sold. Now, you see, it didn't happen overnight. And some of you need to realize these things don't happen overnight. Sometimes you have to stand in faith on what you said. Now, in fact, about a week or so after that, you know, my carnal mind began to enter into it. And my carnal mind said, now, what are you going to do, big mouth? You've made all these statements. You've talked to the house, and it's not sold. So I just drove back out there. I stuck my head out the window. It's cold as in the wintertime. I rolled the window down and stuck my head out the window. And I said, ha, ha, ha. Just, you know, it was a forced laugh because it wasn't too funny. I just <laughs> laughed at it, <laughs> you know, just laughed at the house. Well, you're going to have to learn to release your faith in laughter. Learn that God's Word's true, and once you've established something, once you've agreed, once you've spoken, don't come off of that. Just stand at it. And when all circumstance begin to say it's not true, just laugh at it.